Okay, Chemistry 111, we're getting ready uh, to take on our second exam for the course. And um, this problem set is our second um, uh, extra practice problems for uh, preparation for this exam. And this is the one that I think is the best for your last minute studying. I know you have a couple days till the exam, but this is a really good one for seeing if you're ready, right? Because if you this, this problem set is really, really close to how long an exam might be. So if you can prepare, uh, and kind of clear out some time and, and tackle these problems within 50 minutes. You'll and, and if you can complete it and you feel good, you're ready for the exam. If you're still confused, hopefully this answer key will help you out a little bit. So let's go ahead and dive right in and, and take a look. And so uh, let me turn the the pin on real quick here. Um, there we go. Okay, so. This first one deals with naming, right? And that's really important. We did, we spent a lot of time on naming compounds. And so here we have, and writing formulas. And so here's aluminum sulfate. If you're given a name, you should be able to write a formula. And the trick here is that you have to remember that aluminum, right, from the pre table, you can look up aluminum. And then you should remember sulfate, right? Sulfate is SO4, right? And that's a two minus. And that's kind of difficult because you got a two minus and a three plus. And they have to balance each other out to be neutral because the salt, aluminum sulfate, is neutral. Uh, if you have a three plus, if we take two of them, we end up getting six plus, and that means we can take three sulfates and make that a six minus. So there you go, you have aluminum sulfate. This is clearly a salt, which means it is an ionic compound. Uh, carbon and sulfur here are both non-metals, so odds are that is a molecular compound, and we will call that simply carbon. And we have two sulfurs, right, so that would be di, Disulfide, pretty easy. Um, this one here, we have barium, right? Barium we know is a metal. That's our, it's a two plus, right? And acetate, that's one that you have to uh, go back and look up if you haven't remembered, right? That's really important. It's one of those ones you had to know, the polyatomics. You have C2H3O2, right? That's acetate, and you should remember that acetate has a, a negative one charge, and so if you have a positive two, we're going to need two of these to balance out. So you have barium acetate, and that is, of course, ionic compound. Here you have this phosphorus oxygen compound. That's definitely molecular because they're all nonmetals. And here you'll use your, your prefixes. So that's di, uh, that's not potassium, right? That's diphosphorus, right? Diphosphorus. And then there are five oxygens. So that's going to be pentoxide. Pentoxide. There you go. Pretty simple. Okay, the second one, define the mole unit and explain why the concept of the mole is so valuable to chemists. We spent a lot of time talking about the mole. Um, so here we think about what is the mole. Well, the mole is the SI unit of amount, right? So it's an SI unit of amount. And it's equivalent to the amount of particles, right? The amount of particles that are contained in exactly 12 grams of carbon 12, right? And that number uh, we talked about is a constant that we will give you, which is called Avogadro's number. And that number is 6.022 times, remember it's a really big number, right? Really big number, 10 to the 23rd. So there you go. So that's, that's the number, that's the constant, right? Now why is it so important? Well remember that as chemists, if we go in the lab, we deal with the macroscopic scale, right? That's the macroscopic scale. That's grams and kilograms and stuff we weigh out, right? Milliliters if we're dealing with liquids. The problem is that we often as chemists want to relate that to what we call the microscopic scale. The microscopic scale, right? When they're talking about atoms and ions and molecules, right? And so the mole is so important because the mole allows us to act as a conversion factor for jumping between the macroscopic scale, the stuff we weigh in lab, versus the microscopic things, the theoretical things that we think about in terms of atoms and molecules and whatever. So that's really important. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and jump into a, another really important type of problem that we worked on, which was the empirical molecular formula problems. And those are really critical, so make sure you can solve these. So we have a sample, right? And we see that it's uh, 40.6846 grams of carbon. It's also got uh, 5.1215 
grams of hydrogen. And why am I converting these grams? Because I'm using what I call the 100% approach where I say this is a hundred percent of the uh, composition so I'm going to assume that I had a hundred grams of beginning material so I just convert the percents to to masses um, you can do whatever you like to do but I find this is a really uh, simple way to approach the problem and so here we go we've got basically our percentages we converted them to grams so we say four right uh, 100 gram sample and that will give us everything we have here. Just converted those in. So what we want to do now, right, we just got done talking about the mole. Let's go ahead and convert these to moles. And here we can say that for one mole of carbon, that's what, roughly 12.01 grams of carbon. And here's, I want you to label your units here. Label everything, because it can really save you uh, when you're working on these problems in, in during the exam. And so in this case, I get roughly 3.0 three nine moles of carbon over here I'm gonna do exactly the same thing but I'm working with hydrogen so it's one mole of hydrogen and here we go a mole of hydrogen is 1.01 grams of hydrogen and that gets me something on the order of 5.07 moles of hydrogen and then our last one because there are only three components one mole of oxygen and we know that that's 16.00 grams of oxygen. You can look these up on the periodic table if you don't know them. It does not matter. You will have a periodic table. And now you'll say, okay, what do we do now? I've got, I took this um, 100 gram sample, so to speak, and, and divided it up into the number of moles. And now I want the, the definition of the empirical formula, right, is the lowest whole number ratio. So I'm gonna take uh, oxygen here and that'll be one because you cancel this out, right? There we go. And then here we have 3.38 moles of oxygen. And this one gives me something like, oh, I think it's 1.5. And then this ratio, right, 3.38 moles. And again, that's so close. I'm gonna go ahead and call that one. Now, you might be tempted at this point to write you know, C1, H1.5, O1, but remember, the definition of empirical is that it's gotta be a whole number ratio. So in order to get this to a whole number, we've gotta multiply them all by two, because that 1.5, you can't let that stand, right? You've gotta multiply these all by two, and goodness me, I'm really sleepy. I almost made a big mistake there. And so when we uh, write this out, we get um, C2, H3, Three, O2. And that's the empirical formula, right? That's the empirical formula. That's the, the lowest whole number ratio. And the question asks you, what would you need to determine the molecular formula? Well, we can determine the mass of this grouping, and this grouping would be the empirical mass, and then we would have to be given the mass of the actual molecule we're looking at. So we'd, ha be ha we'd have to be given a molecular mass, right? And then we'd know how many of these units go into the actual molecular mass and then we have to multiply by a factor of a whole number so if it's this number it'd be one and that would be the same empirical formula that the molecular formula would be but it could be a multiple of this it could be C4H6O4 and, or any other multiple of that again it has to be a whole number multiple because the definition of the empirical formula is the lowest whole number ratio but as long as you're given the molecular um, the molecular mass you you would be able to convert from the empirical formula to the molecular formula and that's pretty simple this is the hard part okay uh, here are some little kind of fill in the blank type things um, this one says okay bonding theory that describes molecular geometry via repulsion uh, of density regions so again this is simply a valence shell electron pair repulsion theory of Vesper right uh, the scientist who proposed a theory of chemical bonding, he won a Nobel Prize, not only in chemistry, but also peace. This was our friend Linus Pauling, right? And so we talked about Linus Pauling earlier in the, the course uh, for this exam. General term to describe compounds that dissolve in water to produce ions. Remember, these are things that dissociate. These are going to be electrolytes, right? Electrolytes in your energy drinks. Bonding theory that describes hybrid orbitals. Well, remember that's that's hybrid would be valence 
bond theory, right? And then finally, concentration of a solution expressed as milligrams per liter. We remember we talked about this when you're dealing with really small amounts, we call this PPM. Um, there you go, pretty, pretty simple there. Okay, I'm gonna jump into the, the next one here. It looks like um, I've got a little bit of a, a problem here. Um, I've lost uh, some structure. Um, there we go. Let's let's see here. Um, don't know what's going on here. I think for some reason there was a formatting problem here. Um, let's see. There we go. Yeah, I just jumped a line break. I'm sorry. Uh, no big deal. We're back on track. I. I guess it just the page break didn't take. But anyway, this five looks correct. I think this is what you have in front of you. I apologize. Just want to make sure I, I had, wasn't working on the wrong one here. Okay, so anyway, back on track. So we've got the, the cyanate ion, this OCN, where C is the central atom, and it says, note that the carbon's essential, so I gave you that one. Uh, now, draw three resonance structures for OCN uh, and give us the formal charges and circle the one you believe is best and here's a little caveat don't violate the octet rule okay well I'll just go ahead and draw one the first thing I would do is say okay please don't be afraid to count electrons right so we've got six from the oxygen plus four from the carbon we're counting valence electrons five for the nitrogen but don't forget the the fact that this is an anion right so you got ten plus five plus six this is going to be 16 electrons that's always the first thing to do even if you really get confident we'll put the carbon in the middle um, <laughs> this does not like it when I draw in a box uh, so we'll try this I hope you can keep up with that so now we've used two bonds that's four electrons we got 12 left so we'll put some around here one two three four oh it's gonna get so messy uh, five six one two three four five six and that's 12, and, and that looks okay. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put the, the brackets because I like to count uh, the overall charges, but very quickly you'll realize carbon is not okay. It does not have a, an octet. So what we can do is we can bring, uh, we'll get rid of this lone pair and turn it into a bonding pair, just one. Um, and then, oh goodness, carbon still doesn't have a bonding, an octet. So we'll get rid of that one and do that. Uh, that puts a double bond on both. Let's go ahead and look at our, I'm gonna go ahead and erase those lone pairs. They, they kind of bother me. We'll get rid of those there. There we go. Oh no, that's not good. Um, nitrogen disappeared there. Um, so now we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. We still have our correct number of electrons. Carbon has a zero formal charge. This oxygen has a zero formal charge. This nitrogen right has valence of five minus uh, two, four, uh, five, six, so that's a negative, which is good because these must add up to what's the overall charge. And so here we have a negative charge on the nitrogen, which doesn't look that bad. I mean, nitrogen's pretty electronegative, so that sounds okay. So now we can move these around. So let's go ahead and say, well, if we kicked in another bond here, instead of putting them even, right, we have two and two, but we could go three and one, and that would still give carbon um, a uh, octet, right? And so we can go one, two, three, and do that. I'll still put my little brackets on there. Um, and so here we say okay, and then we need to make sure that we actually have our number of uh, electrons total equals the same. Because remember, this is a resonance structure. We're only moving electrons, not moving anything else. So let's count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. We're good there. Um, octet rule for the carbon. That has a zero val uh, formal charge over here. Uh-oh, I've got 6 minus 2. Gives me 4 minus 3. Oh, no, I've got a, that's not good. I've got a positive charge on oxygen. Oh, I don't like that. And then here we've got 5 minus 6 minus 1. Oh, no, this is a bad resonance structure. I've got a negative 2 on nitrogen. Um, Whenever you have formal charge, charge is greater than one, that's a bad thing. And then you've got a really electronegative oxygen with a positive. I, I, I don't think I'm going to like that one. Um, but let's try the other one, right? Because we have two and two here, and then we have three and one. Why don't we go three over here and one over here? Let's see what we get. We'll go one, two, three with our nitrogen there, and just one with the oxygen. We'll put our little brackets over there. 
and indicate the charge. In this case, the nitrogen only needs two. The carbon, however, needs one, two, three, four, five, six. And let's just count one, two, three, four, five, or six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That looks good. Carbon still has a zero formal charge. This nitrogen now has uh, five minus two minus three is zero. And this oxygen, well, we know it should be a negative, but let's check it out. So six minus six minus one, bingo. Okay, so my choices are uh, this one, which over here I think is, is kind of a bad one. I don't, I don't like that one at all. Um, and then I would look at these two and I'd say, okay, I've got zero, 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 zero. Do I want my negative charge on oxygen or do I want my negative charge on nitrogen? Well, there, either way, it's not terrible, but if I had to choose one and I had to circle one, like the question says, I would circle this one because I like having um, the negative charge if it's only a choice between nitrogen and oxygen, I will put on oxygen because it's the most electronegative. Okay, um, down here, but this is not a terrible one in the middle. It's it's not a terrible Lewis structure. Okay, so here's this, based on your answer above, estimate the carbon nitrogen bond energy. Well, if we circled this one, we said that's our best one. Um, I would say that the most um, probable or the most energetically favorable would be the triple bond. And if I can find the triple bond, it's right there on the table. It would be roughly 891 uh, kilojoules per mole. That's a nice strong bond. Now, you could say, like, if you really wanted to be fancy, and, and there's no reason to get fancy on an exam, just you know, answer it directly and, and be done. You could say that this middle structure is not bad, so maybe it's somewhere between a double bond and a triple bond because you could say this contributes a little bit because it's pretty good whereas this one's just garbage don't even worry about that one but you could say it's some weighted average of this one where maybe this is the better structure but there's a little bit of double bond character so it could be somewhere in between your call um, but again if you're just doing the one you circled you can just come down here and say this guy or you could say it's somewhere in between I would take both answers now ultimately you could go in the lab like we did and use the IR uh, spectrophotometer right and you could actually measure you know you could take the spectrum right and you get all those nice peaks right that you you dealt with in lab and you could measure the the wave numbers right remember wave numbers from lab and you could um, here it was what the percent T and you could say well you know I found a peak here that um, belongs to something that looks like this uh, bond here and we could say oh well we were right and experimental evidence will support that or you could say no 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 we actually found something that was more like a double bond so maybe this one's better ultimately you'd have to actually go in lab and get some data and be able to look it up and so remember that infrared spectro uh, spectro spectroscopy excuse me uh, looks at the vibrations of these bonds and if we treat the bonds like springs we can figure out well um, would the peaks be different for a triple bond versus a double bond and they sure would because the spring constant if you would the bond strength is different and you can see it on the table so the peaks would be very very different for these two materials and so we could actually figure out which one is the most likely supported by the experimental evidence and that's something you learn how to do in lab which is kind of a neat connection um, that's kind of a tough one alright let's get to something that's a little bit um, more familiar to you and so this idea of uh, looking at a molecule that looks kind of crazy and it, we're going to point at some different bonds and say okay well what is this bond angle well here we have what um, a hydrogen on one side and a carbon on one side now this is one group even though it's a triple bond and that's one group so if there are only two groups on this carbon they want to be as far as part as possible so I'm going to say that's 180 degrees um, this one here you're going to have oh careful there's a lone pair there one two three four things they're going to want to be as far apart as possible so that's going to be based upon a tetrahedron. Uh, 109.5 would be the ideal angle. But you know that you would have some deviation maybe from this lone pair that repels more. So I'd say it might actually be um, a little bit lower than this. But right now we're only worried about the ideal. And then finally this one here where we've got one, two, three groups of things. No lone pair. So there are three things. They want to be as far apart as possible. So that would be 120. We look at the hybridization, or to get 180 degrees apart, you have to use SP hybridization. In order to be uh, 109.5, you have to use SP3. And in order to be 120, you have to use SP2. And we talked about that before. Finally, how many sigma bonds? Now remember, this is important. 
there always has to be at least one sigma bond between atoms. So I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine connections. So that means you need at least nine sigma bonds. Everything after the first sigma bond will be a pi. So here this would be one sigma plus two pi to make that triple bond. This would be one sigma plus one pi to make that double bond. So here we're gonna have one, two, three pi bonds. So there you go, pretty simple. Now it looks like my page break had the same problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to uh, push this down by, there we go, it looks a little bit, a little bit better there. Um, this next question is a, di a dilution question and that's pretty um, important, right? We talked about dilutions a lot at the end of the um, unit and we talked about them a little bit in lab as well. So here you need to prepare 250 mils of this molarity sodium hydroxide from a stock solution that's given to you. Okay, well that's pretty easy. Let's take what we know, right? We can say, all right, well, we know we need 250 mils, right? So that's important. And we want this, we want, this is our target, right? That's what we want to make. So let's go ahead and throw that down here. 1.25 times 10 to the negative third. I always like to write these um, as moles of solute over liters of solution, because that's the definition of molarity, right? That M is not very useful unless you break it out when you're solve, solving your problems. And so what I'd like to do now is I want to know the volume. Okay, so that probably means I need to cancel the moles. Okay, so let's use this one over here and we'll divide, right? And here we'll say, okay, um, I need to do what? I need to, um, let's see here, we need to get um, 0 0.0380 moles of stock solution per liters of solution, right? That's good. So now we've got um, moles canceled and we needed what? Um, we needed 250 mils of this, so we'll put 250 mils up here, right? And then now we can say um, we want to convert this to what? We want to go, oh maybe we'll do 1,000 milliliters per liter. That means our milliliters cancel. We've got liters there. Um, and then so finally now um, we can say, okay, um, that should leave us with the amount of uh, solution. So let's go ahead and crank this out. And this one, unfortunately, I did not uh, calculate yet. So I'll try this on my own calculator while you work with me on your own work. So negative three. Uh, divided by 0 0.0380 times 250 mils divided by a thousand. I get something like um, a really small number. Um, let's see, what did I get here? I got something on the order of, um, I think I got something like 8.22 milliliters does that make sense um, you I mean actually here you're gonna get liters right so I shouldn't I should be more careful and say you'd actually get something like 0 0.00822 liters but that is very simply uh, multiply by 1000 milliliters per liter right and you get the same thing so it's fine so all we did here was we just took what we had, right? And the key here, I think, is so important to know that anytime you have a big M, please write that as moles per liter, and that's really critical. So we took our moles, we canceled the moles, because that's a ratio, right? They're both sodium hydroxide. They're just a stock solution. Um, basically, um, if you think about it, they're the same material, we're just diluting it. So if you think about what's going on here, you could say, okay, well, I take the find out the number of moles I have here, right? Because if you're multiplying this by, guy by this guy, um, you're gonna get the number of moles, and the moles d doesn't matter, um, you know, how much you you um, you dilute it or, or, or concentrate it. The moles don't change, just the volume does. And so here we did a ratio, essentially, and we found out that it we only need about, um, what, we take 8.22, milliliters of this concentrated material, right? And then we d dissolve it in form a, a total final volume of 250 mils and we've got what we need right there. So there you go. All right, and then 
the last one here, um, let's see, or the, the last uh, formal charge argument one here that we're worried about. Uh, this is looks like a crazy complicated molecule, right? But it's not that bad. It's a circle, the best Lewis structure based on formal charge. Okay, hydrogens, right? Hydrogens one minus one, so we don't care about these hydrogens. Don't let them distract you. It's a lot of extra work. Again, just get rid of them. Don't worry about them. Okay, now let's jump into this one. Oxygen, what's the formal charge of single bound oxygen? What's well, six minus six minus one? So that's a, a negative one. This carbon has four minus four minus one more, four minus five, right? So what is that? That's gonna be uh, minus, right? Which is kind of odd for carbon. This carbon, four minus four, that's a zero. So we don't need to worry about that. Um, what about this sulfur though? We've got what, six? Uh, minus four. Ooh, that's going to be a plus two. I don't like that very much. Um, hmm. Yeah, remember, this kind of goes back to the resonance question above where we were talking about uh, plus two. That's, that's kind of bad. So I'm a little circumspect of that one. Here we go. Carbon, that's a zero. That's a zero. One, zero, zero. Okay, here's an auction. Six minus four minus two. Ooh, that's nice. Zero. Uh, sulfur, six minus two minus four. Zero. Wow, this is that one's looking pretty good I like that one um, these we don't worry about okay here we got six minus six minus one. Oh, there we go and then this one uh, sulfur is six minus two minus three okay so that looks like we're left with a positive one so of all of these I would say that um, I would definitely go with this one um, this one I really don't like because of the plus two here uh, the one over here, it's not too bad. He might be my second place choice. Um, it's okay, right? But really the one in the middle is the one that is really, really good. And you can say, why explain your choice because you have um, essentially um, all zero formal charge equals lowest in energy, which is always the best arbiter of which one you're going to pick. All right. This last one here, um, this is a really good uh, structure uh, problem. And so first thing I do um, is I say, okay, I'm going to take 7 plus 21, right? Because we got um, 7 plus 3 times 7. Okay, that's going to give me 28 electrons. And again, I just can't encourage you enough uh, to really count those up and, and help you out. Uh, iodine is the least electronegative, clearly, so we're going to put that one in the middle. And we've got three fluorines that go around it. Um, in this case, now we've subtracted six electrons, and let's go ahead and put um, a few uh, electrons around each outside fluorine so we can give each of those an octet, right? That's a good deal here. And then so, boom, we've got what? Um, 8, 8, 8, that's essentially we've used, what, 24? And so now we've got, oh wow, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're really starting to put some extra lone pairs on this central atom. And iodine can handle it, right? Iodine is, is, is pretty big, so we can have an expanded uh, more than an octet. And so let's just double check, right? So we've got 1, 2, 3 times 8 is 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. So we do have uh, 28 electrons. Hopefully I counted correctly for you. Um, now we need to think about the geometry, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and say, this one is roughly based on a uh, trigonal bipyramid, right? And so if you had to, you would put the, the lone pair up here uh, in, behind the paper, and then you would have a lone pair coming in front of you. Remember, this is based on trigonal bipyramid, so you're gonna have the two axial fluorines and then another equatorial fluorine, and you always put the lone pair on the equatorials. So if you kind of hide these, what you see is essentially a T-shaped molecule. And that's really important. And then determine the bond angles. Well, the ideal bond angles, right? These would be 90, these would be 90, and then if you uh, change color so you can maybe see a little bit better, right? Um, these will be what, 120? That would be 120, and that would be 120. Those would be ideal, right? And then if you had to think about it, which, 
would you have any deviations? Well, I would say yeah. Remember these lone pairs, right? These lone pairs repel quite strongly, and so I would argue that um, these bond angles here, here, uh, here, and here, so those are all going to be uh, smaller than expected, right? And why is that? Because the, the lone pairs are going to push, they're going to have more repulsion, so it's going to contract and compact everything that's down here. And then this one would be larger than expected because those lone pairs are going to push and make more room for themselves, and so there you go. And then finally, is this molecule polar? And I would say uh, most definitely because you have uh, this fluorine and this fluorine, they are directly across from each other, and so odds are they cancel each other out, but this fluorine down here is very electronegative. And then you could argue, well, what about the lone pairs? I would say generally I would probably at first glance draw it like here, and so definitely it's going to be polar. Um, so it's a polar molecule. Now, if you really wanted to go and, and, and argue how polar or in which direction the dipole points, we could actually throw it into Spartan, but I'll go ahead and just take a, a, gam, uh, a gamble and say it's going to be in this direction. Anyway, uh, that's it. I'm running out of time here. Um, took me about 30 minutes to explain it in, in pretty uh, gory detail, so you should be able to knock this out pretty quickly. I hope this has helped. I know a lot of you, um, you know, have been working really hard, and I appreciate that hard work. And I hope you can uh, put some points in the bank and feel good going into fall break. I know you've earned a good uh, couple days away. Uh, you're halfway done with the course, which is wonderful. We're proud of you. Um, but again, you're only halfway done. So keep up the hard work. Don't don't start to slack. And I hope this has helped a little bit. So um, take care. Uh, have a good evening, and do as well as you can. Don't leave anything blank. And um, you know, work more problems and practice and build your confidence. Clear up any confusion and I'll see you at the exam.